Good day to everybody out there. This is Danny Weber. Today we're going to be talking about choosing the right contractor. And before we get started, I want to tell you briefly about a few brands that I that I have in Austin, Texas. Home Simple of Texas, which is real estate mortgages and insurance, the Texas property manager. Investor Depot Cabinets, Countertops, and Flooring, partners with My Cartel, and then the Texas Builder, which is a construction company, partnered with Justin Weber on that project. So Real quick, choosing the right contractor is is sometimes easy, sometimes fun, but there's a lot of risks involved with it. So today we're going to cover ways to bulletproof the process of finding and hiring a contractor as much as possible. And you'll see on a lot of the uh, slides that I've tried to keep things light uh, while at the same time uh, getting some really good information out there. This is my email address, should anybody want to shoot me an email. And then these are the company websites, URLs, if anybody should want to look into doing some business with uh, me and the organization. Would, would appreciate that very much. Let's get started. Here are some alternative names um, that I'd actually considered when putting together this presentation only because if anybody's been in the business for a while as an investor or if you've been a retail homeowner and you had uh, issues with a contractor, hired a contractor, things never go as planned or rarely do they ever go as planned. So here's some alternative names that I came up with when I was writing this presentation. One is how to avoid jail time for killing your contractor. How to find the best hitman to kill your contractor. How to lose money from the comfort of your sofa. How to meet a working sociopath. Contractor love and why there isn't any. How to spend all of your retirement funds in 60 days. How to spend 5000 on repairs and get no repairs. And why did this toilet install cost me $2,500? And really... The sarcasm and list could go on and on and on forever. I'm sure you've had your own, uh, your own experience with your contractors and, and you've got a few titles for this presentation you could throw in there. And certainly feel free to, to leave those in the comments below, either on uh, Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're seeing this, uh, this presentation at. I am currently in Skidra, Greece, a little town outside of Thessaloniki, um, drinking a frappe and enjoying life. Building concerns, risk or theft during a home remodel. What this basically tells you is that there is a 3% chance or 1 in 33 that a contractor or repair guy will steal something for you, or steal something from you rather, um, or your house will get broken into while the remodel is going on. So just a little caution there. I went online and I found Home Advisor had a really good uh, pictorial representation of what it's like to do business uh, with a contractor, really just a home improvement industry. And you look at and you look and see that the uh, the Federal Trade Commission estimates that Americans lost 1.4 billion dollars to fraud and scams in 2012 related to home improvements. And then we get into a few of the details here. Home improvements, $200 billion industry. One third of homeowners have a fear of fraud when hiring a contract. I think that should be a lot higher personally. Here's some red flags, door-to-door -door sales guys, although I don't think all those guys are bad. Some of them are legitimate businesses. Um, name, credentials not verifiable. Certainly that's a red flag. And most of the time, people don't even dig down to even check these guys they meet somebody they like got a good smile wear nice clothes they smell good and then they automatically trust them and that that's part of the whole con uh if you meet a guy like that I'm not saying everybody's like that but <clears throat> you know unfortunately i deal with a lot of folks so i see a lot of this stuff um they offer you an incentive to find customers not so much they don't provide any references you have to get references you have to call references to verify them and you have to really be able to scrub out the uh, BS references, meaning my friend, uh, this is my friend's number, I did some work for him, and they're gonna say anything good about me that I that I tell them to. 
immediate decisions, take your time, get estimates, cannot provide proof of insurance, or the insurance that they provide is not active. And a lot, what a lot of folks do is they will get insurance, pay for it, get the deck page, and then they'll let the insurance expire. And so you have to really call the insurance company to make sure that it's still an enforced policy. Only accept cash. Uh, they want you to get the permits. You can negotiate that one way or another. You get the permits, they get the permits. Materials left over from another job. That actually is realistic. Sometimes you do stockpile materials and you can get a job to apply a little bit cheaper because let's say you've got you know, an extra 20 or 30 sheets of drywall and uh, that's going to help you close the deal, then why not? Uh, research, certainly. Interview, certainly. Talk about money up front. So it's a mixed bag of nuts when you're talking about contractors wanting funds up front. Um, they, uh, like personally for me on the retail side, I don't do business unless I get some funds up front, whether that's, you know, 10% or 50% It's going to depend on the size of the job and the materials that I need. We'll get into a little bit more detail on this later. Um, but there's certainly some things to avoid. If I had to point to one area that I see the most homeowners and investors lose money in, it's going to be they write somebody a check up front and they don't come back. Or they write somebody a check up front, they do one day of work and don't come back. And typically contractors are in a steal from Peter to pay Paul mode, meaning that they underbid two or three jobs before this one and they're literally just using your funds to finish up jobs prior to this because if you're a good contractor especially in austin texas or any other surrounding areas if you're a good contractor you typically are not looking for work work is typically thrown at you and you're rejecting work because work's not paying a lot and so one of the oxymorons in this business is everybody wants something uh cheap fast and they want quality work and you typically can't get all three if you want cheap and fast it's not going to be quality if you want quality work, it's not going to be cheap and fast. And so you really got to choose your choose your poison, so to speak. If you want quality work fast, it, you're going to have to pay for it because most contractors are not breaking away from good paying jobs to do yours to make less money. So 13,000 um, home related, uh, home improvement related complaints. And this was in 2011. And so some of this data is going to be old and, and the numbers are bigger. Once you've selected a contract, uh, contract to get it in writing, we're going to talk about this. Um, if they, you, you really want a contractor that can take credit cards because then there's a dispute process and at least there's a paper trail. Most common contractor scams, chimney repair, roofing repair, and driveway repair. These are the guys that will literally find you in a parking lot somewhere uh, and, and, uh, and ask if you need these repairs and follow you to your house. Get the contract, just full contact info. Business cards don't count. Check their Facebook profile. Um, check references. Get copies of driver's license. I even sometimes will uh, will ask a contract for a one month bank statement just because I want to see if they've got any funds to float the job on. Because I typically will not float um, every part of my job out of my pocket. But the contract has some vested interest in it to make sure that they finish the job, how much experience. And again, this is all part of the getting the, uh, doing the background check on the contract. But the funny thing is a lot of you guys will ask for a referral for a contractor from either another investor or another homeowner. And at some point the contractor did a great job for that homeowner or that investor that you're getting the reference from. But when they do work for you, for some reason, it doesn't turn out right. They end up stealing the works bad. Um, and that's happened to me. I've referred out contractors that I've been using for years to other people, and I've gotten complaints from the folks I've referred them to. So unfortunately, there's no 100% sure way to hire the best contractor, but there are ways that you can screen them and give yourself the best chance to hire the best contractor. Some other things to keep in mind, um, again, real good representation that home advisor did. This is a few years old. If you're dealing with an insurance claim check, uh, make sure that you get that check uh, directly to you. Don't hand it over to your contractor. You're going to need to sign it. Your lender's going to need to sign it. 
any mistakes contractors make on a job, and they make mistakes, right? They're human. Um, but it, it could also be a mistake in the scope of work. So whatever the deal is, make sure that they fix their own errors. That's got to be written into the contract. If you're not responsible for their errors, it's their fault. While the work is being completed, obviously put up all your, your valuables, your medicines, uh, firearms, jewelry. Get all of that stuff out of the way. Pick up anything that can be damaged. Uh, if you notice a problem, stop the contract. We're going to talk about contractor contracts and some language that you can use in there shortly. Make sure all the subs have been paid at the end of the job. Make sure you've got lien releases signed. And then here are the references for all of this information that we put together. And again, Home Advisor right here are the folks that put this together. Really good information. So, and this is true. I have, I have some comedy stuff in here, but this is all stuff that's actually happening on job sites. You might want to find a new contractor if he asks you to help him start his car by blowing in a tube because he's been drinking on the job site now. This has actually happened. This is not a joke. This is reality. These are some of the guys that you're going to run across in this industry that may present well, look well, and at the end of the day, you just don't don't deliver. Obviously, you'd want to get that job that guy off the job site uh, just for liability purposes. Common project errors, and these are general errors, not necessarily having to do with the contract, but I, I feel like they're they're worth talking about for just a moment and reinforcing. Failure to budget properly. Right now, especially if you're in the in investment industry, a lot of the wholesalers uh, and, and even GCs will present a budget that looks really good to you. You know, they'll give you a $30,000 budget for rehab, when in reality, it's a $50,000 rehab um, for a full project. Or, for instance, if you're on the retail side and you're doing a kitchen remodel, you may say, hey, I've got $15,000 to spend, which is not going to get you a terribly good kitchen remodel unless it's a small kitchen. So you really need to have a budget that's accurate and reflects the materials that you want to use in, in, in the job. I can't tell you, I don't know. I'm probably going to go out on a limb and say one out of 10 people actually meet their budget, their projected budget. And budgets are supposed to be aggressive, right? We're supposed to try to, to cut corners where we can, but you have to be realistic as well. Scheduling, they don't schedule projects the right way. Materials, um, investors specifically think that they're going to be moving in the house. They're living in the house, so they're going to want to buy the most expensive materials and, and, and really uh, blow their budget and, and, and maybe even blow the, uh, the rehab for the neighborhood. I mean, you don't need to buy, uh, you know, Michael Kors stuff for a Walmart neighborhood. And that means that, you know, if you've got a $200,000 rehab in Austin, $150,000 property, $200,000 um, all in. You're, you don't need to buy $6 square foot tile for that project. And the same thing goes for, for a retail client, that if you're in a if you're redoing your kitchen and, you're, and your max value of your house is only going to be worth X, there's no reason to overspend. Your argument could be that, hey, I'm going to be here and I want to enjoy the property. And if that's the case, then so be it. But, but just understand that that's going on. Aesthetics versus value. Making sure that you understand that when an appraiser is looking at a property, they're going to be looking at solid surface or, or hard surface countertops, and they do not necessarily know what level quartz or granite that you have put in the house. All they're going to know is whether it looks good or not, and that's going to be their impression. So, so typically, I'm going to tell you that if you can get something inexpensive that looks good, use it. Contractor scams, we'll talk about that. Contract accountability, we will talk about that. Avoiding mechanics liens. And then failure to have a pre-written scope of work. My big, 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 super big uh, um, kind of failure I see for both homeowners, retail clients, and investors is that they have not taken the time to physically write out a scope of work. And so what happens is they will have a contractor show up and say, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, or Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Hey, I'm thinking about doing that. And it's okay to get ideas from the contractor, certainly, but you do not want them to show up and write your scope of work for you because um, all they're going to see is money signs. They're going to understand that you're an uneducated buyer, an uneducated investor, an uneducated retail client, and then they're just going to start fluffing stuff and telling you stuff that you don't need. And so very important 
you know, it, it's it's probably worth your time to get a designer in there whenever possible. Let them write the scope of work. Let them tell you what needs to be done, um, you know, as that's merged with your ideas of what you want done. That'll definitely help everything if contractors are showing up on your job site and everybody's bidding on the same work. You want to really marry um, or mirror the process that you see in corporate America with RFPs. I think that's a great process. Any changes to the RFP is sent out to everybody so everybody can uh, bid on the same work. Contractor selection tips. License and insure. And in Texas, there's not a general contractor's license like there used to be, but there are trades licenses. So if you're hiring a plumber, an electrician, or if you're hiring a GC and you need plumbing and electrical work done, you want to ensure that the, the, the tradesmen that they're bringing in are licensed, and you want to get a copy of their license, get a copy of their liability insurance. And then, of course, we talk about this all the time. Verify that the insurance is still an enforced policy by calling the insurance company, giving them the number, and asking them if it's still an enforced policy, quick and easy. History of successful performance. Check their references. Look for, look for photos. When you talk to the clients, Ask them very pointed questions, the references. Ask them, hey, what went wrong with this project? I know it wasn't perfect. What, what happened that could have been better? Ask them those questions. Then if it's a big enough project, go look at the work. Ask, you know, ask the folks, say, look, I know, it's, I know I'm being a little intrusive, but can I possibly come look at this? And, and you know, probably 50% are going to say no, but 50% will say yes, and then go out there and do your own due diligence. Tell the people to walk you through the project. Ask detailed questions about how they will perform the work, where they're going to get the material at. This kind of gives some, some validity to the contractor, and it reinforces in your mind that they know what they're doing. Do they look professional? One of my pet peeves, and I know this may just be me, is I like a contractor to look uh, professional. You know, meaning I don't want them showing up in cut-off jeans and a, and a, a tank top. I want them to have a decent looking truck. I want them to be presentable. I want them to talk so that I can understand. And that may just be a pet peeve, but it goes a long way. Do they answer their phone and return calls? Um, basic business 101. Is there estimate in writing with the detailed scope of work? So again, huge uh, warning, warning flags go up if a contractor does not want to put something in writing or if they want cash only. Uh, we'll talk, you know, you know, I'll reinforce that as we go through the video. But you've got to have a scope of work for the project, and then you've got to have a contractor agreement, an actual agreement with the contractor, which is a legal contract, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pages long, that the contractor signs off on with a bunch of clauses that protect you as the homeowner um, or investor. And keep in mind that this is this process is set up to protect the investor or retail client, not the contractor. It's their job to protect themselves. You don't have any fiduciary duty to do anything in their best interest. This is all about protecting you when dealing with contractors. Not that you don't want to be nice, not that you don't want to be fair, but at the end of the day, assume everything is going to court and you're going to have to get in front of a jury or a judge and explain your side of the story. Make sure there are penalties if work is not completed by a certain time. I like this because a lot of folks will come in and say, hey, it's a one week job. You'll give them a deposit. They'll come in and do one, one day of work. Then they'll burn off, go get another deposit from another company or another client, do another day of work at their job. And then two or three days later, they show back up at your job. Long story short is there's gotta be some penalties built into these contracts. If they tell you five days, say, look, I'm gonna give you seven on paper just to make sure that we give a little bit of cushion for unforeseen circumstances and maybe materials. And then if they don't complete the work as prescribed in the contract and, and legitimate issues arise, then you handle it as they come up. Stay clear of these statements. It will be about $50. It should, I should be able to blank the blank the blank. This is not contracting home repairs improvement are not guessing games. The contractor should say, well, if I find this behind the wall, then I'm going to do this. If I find that, then I then I do this. And so you really want to ask pointed questions about the job to make sure that they understand the zigs and the zags that could come up. And ask them a question, what's worst possible, what's worst possible case scenario when you open up this wall? 
I need to be paid in advance. Work out a draw schedule and stick to it. Um, you are going to hear the best excuses you've ever heard in your life when dealing with contractors. My, my son broke his arm. My car broke down. My grandmother died. I had one contractor. This guy's grandmother died twice on the same job. And he, he had forgotten that he told me the first time. It, twice this lady died, poor lady. I had another contractor that his kid broke his arm. And, and, and by this time in the game, I didn't believe anything he said. So I said, show me, and this is horrible to say, but I said, send me a picture of your kid with the cast on his arm. That's where that relationship had gotten to. I need to be paid daily. I'm actually okay doing this if I'm at the job site and I'm checking work performance. So sometimes a contractor, you know, sometimes a day labor guy may need to be paid daily and that's okay. But you want to be there to make sure that the work that they're getting paid for was actually complete, completed. Can I borrow your tools? Now, this is a, a, a red flag in my eyes. Um, for a few different reasons. Number one, if a contractor is borrowing tools from you, if you get a carpenter that shows up and needs to borrow a skill saw, a miter saw, a jigsaw, um, a tape measure, God forbid, you got a problem. That's that that work should probably stop at that moment. If you get a plumber that shows up and needs to borrow a pipe wrench, work should probably stop at that moment. Exception being the guy's got a truck full of tools. He forgot it at home. Something, you know, some type of legitimate excuse. Make, and this is a huge one. This always goes back to scope of work here. Make your own materials list and scope of work. Contractors have no vested interest in your final appraisal. So do not ask them or let them tell you what goes into your rehab or your home remodel. Do not ask a contractor what type of ports are granted or what type of cabinets, what type of flooring should I put here. That is not their job. Their job is to install whatever you tell them to, in to install. And your job is to make sure that you've looked at the appraisal, the ARV value, or whatever you're going to be happy living with if you're a retail client and, and finding those materials. That's how that works. Contractors do not make design decisions. They have no vested interest in your property or, or, or value in your property or your family's well-being. This is me. I'm your real estate professional before, during, and after the zombie apocalypse here. Um, and I made this kind of as a, a, a joke to keep things light. This is actually one of my business cards. And if you uh, if you look here, this is uh, right before I started working out. Right before that. Scams and unethical contractor behavior. I ran into a problem. I need more money. Well, what's the problem? Did you not foresee this problem? This sounds like something you should have assumed was going to happen. I'm not paying you anymore. This would look so much better and it will only cost blank dollars. Again, not their decision. I'm okay with my contractors making suggestions because a lot of times contractors have great ideas. No problem with that, but you got to make sure that it fits your scope of work and your ARV, your budget, or whatever. You know, If you're a retail client, it's got to fit your lifestyle, so you're going to be happy looking at it every day. We are out of materials. Be careful of this. And we don't, we're not going to get into this today, but there is a big discussion and always you know, a polite argument that goes back and forth. Do you buy materials or do they buy materials? And I'll, I will do half and half depending on the type of job. But um, you've got to be aware of contractors having you buy material for their next job or having you buy material for their remodel that they're doing at their own house. And I know that sounds crazy, but, you know, if a contractor says you need 50 one by six by eight pieces of cedar when you only need 30, he goes out and buys 50 on your credit card or via your Home Depot account, and you're not keeping track of that, this guy's going to walk off with 20 pieces of cedar. Now, that starts to add up when you start talking about cedar, caulk, texture, um, shark bite fittings, plumbing fittings, electrical hardware. That gets expensive, so you really need to keep track of that stuff, and that's why it's important you do your own scope of work. For instance, you're getting all your light switches and plugs changed. Well, you go through the your account, I got 30 plugs, and I've got 20 single switches and 24 doubles, or whatever it's going to be, and that goes on the scope of work, and then that way when you're auditing your materials purchase for this job and you see 30 or 30 or some, some numbers that don't make sense, 
you can go back and ask them for these things because a lot of times contractors, unethical contractors, will buy extra material on, on your dime and then go back to Home Depot and return them later for in-house gift cards or even try to get the cash back out. Home Depot are, are very aware of this scam and they've actually made it a little bit harder to do that, but not impossible. Keep that in mind. Purchases cheaper materials and puts it in other boxes. That happens. I don't see that happening as much, but it is a concern. I need half up front. We've talked about this. Never give money up front unless it's a contractor. You know if they say I need half up front to buy materials, then you say I will buy materials. I'll meet you at Home Depot or Lowe's. Or go to the pro desk at Home Depot or Lowe's and call me, and I will pay with the credit card there. But whatever it is, a lot of these things are tailored to contractors you haven't dealt with before. If you've got a contract you, you've used for five or ten years and you're comfortable with them, not that they can't uh, commit uh, fraud or act unethical, but there's a comfort level, that, then a lot of this stuff is not applicable. But up front, you have to assume that um, you are on the losing end of the stick here. And, and unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Starts jobs and then quits without a reason. Uh, you will have contractors show up. You know, you give them some money, they show up for one day, and then they literally just won't return your phone call. It happens all the time. And these guys are typically, they're dealing with a an addiction of some type, alcohol, drugs. Uh, maybe they go to jail. Maybe this is just their MO and the way they work. But but reality is, this is what is out there. Uh, and that's why it's a lot of times, it's, it's better to hire a more expensive company with a brick and mortar storefront uh, and, and just get the job done. That way, there's a lot more comfort in that in that in that direction. Underbids everyone specifically with the intent to get your money and then not do the job, and then they're into that you know steal from Peter to pay Paul. Trash talks other contractors. Look, we you know as a contractor myself with the Texas Builder, we all trash talk other contractors a little bit, um, a little bit you know because we all feel like we provide the best value, the best service, the best everything. And, and where this really gets bad is if you hire a contractor that doesn't finish a job and then you call us in or another contractor to come in and finish the job, well, then, you know, it, it's really tough for the, the, the new contractor because you don't know a lot of times what their logic was for doing certain things on a job site. And it could have made perfect sense at the time, but because you weren't there for the very beginning of it, it doesn't make sense to you. And so uh, just be aware of that problem. You know, a little trash talking, in my opinion, is okay, but you don't want it to go overboard. Or if it does go overboard with the contractor, you know, maybe maybe that's a red flag. And the other thing uh, to keep in mind is I, I, again, a pet peeve of mine is if a contractor says that they're going to start on a certain day and certain time, I want them in my driveway or on property at that time. If they're going to be late, they're going to miss a day, they're going to miss an hour, then I expect a phone call. That's just common business courtesy. If you get a contractor that schedules an appointment with you or to start work, you know, Monday at 10 a.m., and no call, no show, and then you've got to chase them down, almost like a bad relationship. Well, guess what, guys? That's what that's going to turn into is a bad relationship. I think contractors need to show up when they say they're going to show up and, and start when they say they're going to start. If they don't, then they need to call ahead. We talked about insurance. Make sure you get a copy of their insurance and make sure you validate their insurance. Right here, get everything in writing. I cannot reinforce this enough. This is how you end up in court. This is how you get a mechanics lien on your property. This is how you end up getting sued or having to sue somebody. Keep your receipts. Um, always get lien waivers signed with payments. I usually get them signed with every payment, but definitively, definitely with the last payment. Everything in writing. Do your own scope of work. Not negotiable there. Talked about this a little bit. Build performance guidelines into the contract. Um, verify GL insurance. I know I'm harping on this stuff, but it's so important. Change orders need to be up front on paper uh, so everybody understands what's going on. And change orders are how contractors, um, unethical contractors, make a lot more money. Now, let me tell you this about change orders. Change orders are typically inevitable almost on every job because as a contractor we cannot foresee everything your contractor cannot guess everything but they should know most things so change orders are, are typically coming from two different directions one direction is oh we opened up this wall and didn't realize this or hey danny your work looks great i'm going to change my mind and i want to extend this wall another four inches after talking with my husband yeah, that's a change order. Both of those are change orders. Both of them are legitimate change orders. Change orders that I don't like, personally, 
is if I say, uh, or if I contract with, with someone to change out a toilet, well, I'm going to assume that they know that they need to change the wax ring, right? Same thing with, I don't know, faucet. You get a new faucet or sink installed. I'm going to assume that they know that, that I want new P-traps and valves. And I know that's a big assumption, but I tell folks up front, that, that, that that's part of the scope of work. They see it in writing. And sometimes they may hit you with, oh, well, you didn't say that you needed an discussion on, on these on these new valves. And and so, okay, I get that. But if you're getting a contract that's nickel and dime and you like that, then you've got other issues coming down the pipeline anyway. But again, it's a two-way street. If you're being fair with your contract, your contract should be fair with you. There is specific site insurance that they can get. We talked about referrals already. Craigslist. Craigslist is your friend and your foe. Don't use Craigslist labor or any other day labor unless you can be there 24-7 to monitor them. And always assume that if you're going to hire Craigslist labor, um, double whatever you need. If you need three guys, uh, schedule six because you have to assume 50% are not going to show up, if not more. It's just a running joke in the industry. Never pay until the job is 100% complete. This is without exception. Do not pay hold back 500, hold back 1,000, hold back 2,000, depending on the size of the job. What you don't want to do is get into a situation where your contractor just keeps, you know, you got one hour of work, but he keeps putting you off to do it because there's no vested interest in him and him getting it done because he's already been paid. So hold the money till the very end or hold some percentage of the money till the very end. Change locks if contractors had keys. Ask your GC for copies of everyone's driver's license on site or take pictures of license plate. Ask them how they screen their employees. You typically want to ask a GC or a contractor up front if these are your full-time guys that work for you all the time or are you going to have day labor on my site. And that goes for both retail and for investor. And if they're going to have day labor on your site, again, we've already talked about this, um, you know, you don't want anything laying around that somebody could steal. If you're going to have high-end uh, light fixtures, high-end plumbing fixtures, high-end anything, keep those at your house or away from the job site, or even leave them at Home Depot, Lowe's, or any of these other uh, uh, stores until you need them. They're safer there than they are on your job site. I have had uh, one of my job sites raided off of Shoal Creek, um, North Central, or really Central Austin, and uh, lost a few thousand dollars worth of material and tools in one night. So, again, this is not a joke. You might want to find a new contractor if you have to bail him or her out of jail more than once. Now, the funny thing is that I will and have actually bailed my contractors out of jail. My CPA actually, as of about a week ago, uh, sent me an email saying, Hey, Danny, I see a line item for bail in your QuickBooks, what was that about? It, 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 it's funny, but I will bail a good contractor, a good worker out of jail if needed, and then just take it out of his check, assuming that he's going to come back. And typically, I wouldn't do it if I didn't. But I have done that, and I will do that in the future because good quality tradesmen are hard to find. Not saying you need to do it, but I have done it, and uh, I know other uh, investors that have done it. Avoiding mechanics liens. I can't tell you how important this is. Uh, if you've never been sued or had to sue somebody or had to go to court for a mechanics lien, the, the thing that you need to understand is that no matter what paperwork you get signed, releases of mechanics liens, the firm, anything you can possibly draw up, your attorney can draw up, will not stop somebody from filing a mechanics lien. And sometimes you won't even know that they filed it. That's like saying, oh, I'm never going to get sued. Well, guess what? You can get sued for anything at any time of the day. Somebody just literally has to go fill out the paperwork, and then you've got to, you've got to spend your time and your money getting an attorney to fight it. So you cannot avoid mechanics liens. What you can do is you can have a solid enough case that if you need to go to court to get it removed or fighting this, that you can get it removed. Everything's in writing. I like recording all my phone calls. So, for instance, if I've got a bunch of projects going on, I will turn on my automatic call recorder and record all my phone calls. And you want to definitely audit this to make sure that it's capturing both sides of the conversation. But it's important because 
when you go to court or if you're having a disagreement with your contract, you can go back to the phone call and say, hey, listen to this conversation, what you agreed to. And if there's a very important conversation that happens, I typically will stop what I'm doing after the conversation, take the audio file and email it to myself so that I have it in the file. Sounds crazy, but it only takes one time getting sued before you learn a lot of these lessons or you have to sue somebody. Save all written messages. Take screenshots of your text messages. Check the financial stability of your GC. Get references and, and you can go as far as to say, hey, how liquid are you? How do you have cash to float this? Can you show me a bank statement that's not zeroed out? Right, because you don't want a contractor living paycheck to paycheck. If you have a contractor like that, uh, a small contractor, you have to assume that they're either new to the area, they don't know what they're doing, or they're not good with financing, or they've got some other issue. Unfortunately, I'm gonna, I am going to assume the worst and not the best because the worst is what hurts you, the best doesn't. Get references, talk to subs that they use, get lien release waiver forms, um, paper trails on all payments. If you pay somebody in cash, write them a check, have them sign the back of a check on the spot showing that they've received payment in cash. The other thing is get W-9s from these folks. You cannot, you know, if you haven't done it already and you go to your CPA or your, your accountant at the end of the year and you're turning in a bunch of receipts for work done at your house and they're saying, okay, we need a 1099, this person as an investor or even at, at, on a retail side if you've got a business of some type. And you say, well, you know, Bobby Smith did it and all I have is his phone number. You're going to be up a creek because at, at some point you're going to have to absorb that liability yourself on your taxes. So it's extremely important to get a W-9, get a copy of their driver's license. Um, at the very least, if not a copy of their driver's license, social security card or driver's license and ITIN. But you will uh, feel the pain of that the first time, the first year you do it. That is a promise. Don't be afraid to terminate your agreements with these guys. These are not marriages. You can terminate it, but you've got to have a reason to terminate. So you've got to have clauses in your contract that talks about reason for termination. And what happens if they don't want to terminate? Well, in every real estate contract, there's, there's mediation arbitration clauses. Um, one of the things that I like to do is put in my contracts Work will be evaluated every Friday, and at that time, Friday at 5 p.m., I will choose to either extend or release your agreement based on the work completed. Sounds harsh, but it's reality. That gives me a clear cut uh, out if I go to court and a contractor is saying, we had an agreement, and I'm owed the other $20,000 even though the work wasn't finished, and I go to this and say, as of this date, Friday, September 15th, uh, I inspected the work. I wasn't pleased. I terminated the contract. I paid you for work completed as per the contract. Party is over with. Get an attorney. If somebody threatens to file a mechanic lien, a mechanics lien, although an attorney can't prevent it, he can try to step in and dissuade the contractor from doing that. Not one of the things you got to understand is getting a mechanic lien is not avoidable. Um, it, it will happen if somebody wants to file, and you can't stop them. And in, in today's world versus 10 or 15 years ago, contractors know about this, and this is a very big threat. Uh, this threat is used a lot now, whereas 10 or 15 years ago, uh, you may have heard it once out of every 100 times you deal with a contractor and the relationship goes south. Now you're hearing it quite a bit because they know it's a pressure point. Things to have on hand as a reminder. Written contractor agreements. I've got some samples of these. If you want to email me, I'll send you a couple that I've got. Um, lean releases, lean waivers. There's a bunch of different names for them. Have those on site. Get those signed by everybody. Written scopes of work. We talked about that numerous times. Multiple trade estimates. If you've got plumbers, uh, electricians, whatever, get multiple estimates unless you've just got a company that you dealt with a lot. One of the things that I don't like to do is I don't like to play I don't like to pay plumbers to dig or electricians to demo. So, for instance, if I need to replace a sewer line in a house or if I need to replace a line going to the, the clean out or anything like that, I will have my day labor guys trench the hole, dig up the hole, bust up whatever I'm doing. And then I'll have the plumber, electrician, whatever it is, come in and do what they are licensed to do, which is be plumbing or electrician. 
plumbers and electricians, HVAC guys, they, they're, they're not licensed to dig holes. I know it sounds kind of crazy. You don't need a license to dig a hole. Get a $10, $12, $15 an hour guy to dig your holes and do all your demo, and then have the electricians and plumbers come in and do the work. It will cut your estimate down probably by 50 or 75% because they're going to be charging you, um, 90% of the time, they're going to charge you their trade labor rate per hour, which could be $75 to $135 an hour to dig a hole. Not good. Copies of insurance, we talked about that. Make sure it's valid. Materials list. You want to have your materials chosen from where so that the contractor doesn't have a guess, or doesn't have to guess where to get them from. I love accounting software when you're, when you're, especially as an investor, if you're doing a bunch of projects, you need accounting software because you need to be able to code the different receipts and the different man hours to different projects. Um, make sure you have an attorney to consult if needed and then a CPA to consult. Um, more so on the investor side, uh, retail clients, you need to have your books in line and you need to know if you're spending money uh, in what areas so that maybe there's some deductions you can pay for along those lines. Don't forget, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Look up Danny Weber at youtube.com. I hope you found this video informative. I will endeavor to keep these videos shorter in the future. Um, give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Leave comments if you like it. And then um, I covered this up with the logo, but if you want to follow up with some business in one of these areas, Home Simple Texas, Texas Property Manager, Texas Builder or Investor Depot, uh, certainly um, shoot me an email or leave a comment and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks so much. Danny Weber. Have a great day.